Welcome back to The Ed Show. Conservative author and filmmaker Dinesh D'Souza is pushing back on progressivism. D'Souza's newest project doesn't shy away from confronting the ideological differences that make his work so discussed. The new film is America, Imagine the World Without Her. This idea that America is based on theft is never effectively answered. And in fact, many of its premises seem undeniable. Didn't we in fact take the country from the Indians? Didn't we in fact steal the labor of the blacks? And so on. So in this film, America, I want to take this progressive leftist critique head on. I want it to be articulated by its best spokesman, and then I want to effectively answer and debunk it. Through interviews, including one with yours truly, D'Souza seeks to challenge the liberal view of how we look at our nation's past and present. Let's see how he did. Joining me now is our rapid response panel, the filmmaker himself, Dinesh D'Souza, Zerlina Maxwell of thegrio.com, and Eric Bollard, senior fellow at Media Matters. Dinesh, part two here for us, I suppose. <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> you seek to challenge the theft and pillage narrative of America's history. How do you reconcile the slave trade and land grabs from Native Americans? Well, first of all, you have to remember that the ethic of conquest, the idea that you get land by grabbing it from someone else, has been occurring since the dawn of mankind. We talk about the Native Americans as a single group, but they are as diverse as the people of Europe. When the Europeans got here, every piece of land that was occupied by a Native American tribe, that tribe had by and large taken it from some other tribe. So the strong tribes like the Apache and the Navajo and the Comanche had been raiding and conquering the weaker tribes like the Pueblo and the Hopi. So when the the Spanish came here, they were doing basically the same thing. And this was all, by the way, 200 years before America. We condemned Christopher Columbus in 1492, but America was started in 1776. So the distance between Columbus and the founding is about as big as the distance between the founding and today. So sometimes I think what the left is doing is blaming America for a conquest ethic that is universal uh, and to which America came up with a very yeah. innovative solution. <laughs> solution, right. which is the idea of wealth creation. Well, look, but look, the, the, the point is that when we do comparative analyses, look, for instance, when we talk about slavery, if you look at books that talk about comparative analysis of slavery, as you make in your film the argument that, look, there was indentured servitude and there were other nations that, in, uh, that enslaved their uh, people, but not until America, where Christianity was directly involved, was the kind of sanctification of the process of slavery in relationship to divine intent made slavery such a heinous act. So even though we have comparative analyses that go out here, they weren't equally as savage as what happened in America, and there weren't the devastating dehum dehumanizing impacts that slavery had. So even if there are, there's truth to what you're saying, the greater truth is that there was much more moral devastation in American slavery than in other forms. Well, first of all, there need to be some important qualifications. You've seen the film, so you know that I admit that there was a racial de dehumanization in American slavery that was, in fact, unique. And yet, even there, there were exceptions. Um, there were approximately, for example, 3,500 black slave owners, free blacks, in the American South who owned more than 10,000 black slaves. Small percentage. So that is a sort of wrinkle. That's a wrinkle that undermines the idea that slavery was purely a black and white issue. But for me, the more important point point isn't that it's, that, it's that slavery was a universal institution, but only one nation, America, fought a great war to end it. So anti-slavery, yeah, abolition, that's the unique achievement of the West and of America. Right, but of course, the, the alternative could have been America could resolve the issue without resort to war. The, 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 the argument could be made that the incredible and unique barbarism that uh, accompanied American slavery occasioned the necessity for a war where other nations can say, look, we got to stop doing this because this is problematic. But I don't want to just be a conversation between me and you. Let me bring in our other guests who are here um, wanting to, uh, to engage you. So, Zerlina, when you uh, look at what uh, Dinesh D'Souza is doing here, what's your take on the comparative analysis of slaveries and the, the ways in which uh, Native American peoples and tribes are having tribal differences mm -hmm. versus the kind of conquest narrative that Dinesh D'Souza says is universal? Well, I think part of the problem here is that we're trying to make um, the response to sort of this black-white narrative fit in 
in that narrative and you're right. missing all this intersectional space. I mean, you had Professor Kimberly Crenshaw earlier on in the show. And one of the things I think is that it's, it doesn't belie the notion that slavery was this inherent uh, evil if you say, well, black people own slaves. That's something that many people maybe not know, but that doesn't necessarily then diminish the progressive argument that it was one of the greatest evils. And also Native Americans, there were certain uh, sects of Native Americans that also owned slaves. That's something that most people don't right. know either. So I just think that, you know, when you're trying to fit it into this black-white dynamic, you're missing most of the points. And I think that, you know, he's off the mark. Right. So, Eric Bowler, what do you think about this? What do you think about the, the narrative framework that says, comparatively speaking, there were other offenses that we uh, viewed in the history of the world. Therefore, what America has done is not necessarily as uniquely uh, egregious as one might think. Well, I mean, that, that's an interesting argument you can make. My bigger problem is mm -hmm. Dinesh D'Souza is not a very good spokesperson for what liberalism is or what progressivism is. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, my bigger problem with him and his work and this, this movie is part of it is this sort of onslaught of portraying liberalism as what it's not. Right. He paints it as this, uh, and Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton as sort of these monsters of the left who are trying to lead America uh, down a dark path. And, and I don't think that's true. And, and from what I understand, I haven't seen the movie. I've read about it. He certainly gets into that in this right. movie. Yeah. And I, I just reject that completely. Well, I did see it. And uh, let me give uh, Dinesh D'Souza a chance to respond uh, to those accusations, especially about, because what he's arguing is that Saul Alinsky had an impact on right. both President President Obama and on Hillary Clinton, and that that Hillary and uh, Barack Obama have much more in common than Hillary and Bill. So, but you respond, uh, Dinesh. Yeah, part of what we do in the film is we show rare footage of Alinsky that really hasn't been seen by anybody. You get to see this man, Saul Alinsky, who, by the way, learned a lot of his tactics at the hands of the mafia. He would hang around with the, the Capone gang, and he says that he would admire the way that they learned how to extort money from people. And for Alinsky, the question was, how do I do that politically? Now, Obama did not have a close relationship with Alinsky. He never met Alinsky, but he admired Alinsky's tactics, and that's why he kept going back to Chicago. Hillary has had very close ties with Alinsky. She met him in high school. She had a continuing relationship with him through college. She wrote her thesis on Alinsky. So the idea of using Alinsky as the bridge between Obama and Hillary is perfectly legitimate, and it's one that the American people should know about. Well, I think Eric Bowler is uh, Bowler <laughs> yeah, is boiling over like, here. I, I want to. Yeah, let me give you a chance to respond very briefly before I go into I mean, my next. I, I, you know, I thought we went through all this in 2009, right. 2010, and Andrew Breitbart was a big proponent of this. All these right-wing sites. They're, I mean, we're going back to high school term papers, college term papers. This is ridiculous. Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton are basically centrist Democrats. Right. Uh, and, and again, this sort of radical notion, I mean, 9 million new jobs, 17,000 uh, stock exchange, uh, unemployment cut in half. I mean, if, if uh, President Romney had done that, Dinesh would be lobbying to have Mitt on the um, Mount Rushmore at this point. Uh, okay, uh, let, me ask, let, me, let me ask Brother <laughs> D'Souza this. So in your film, you respond to Michael Moore's assertion that capitalism and greed are synonymous. Do you believe believe the top 1% of Americans are really unfairly criticized? Well, I think that the attack, the progressive attack, always as pretends to be against the 1%, but it's really against the immigrants. Because when you really look at this theft critique, you stole the country from the Indians, you stole the half of Mexico in the Mexican War. Wait a minute. That wasn't the top 1%. They were living in handsome mansions and cottages on the East Coast. It's poor, penniless immigrants and settlers who went out West. They defeated the Indians. They beat the Mexicans in the Mexican War. So I think progressivism is actually hiding its attack, the real object of its attack is on the immigrants. Wow. So, so really, you want to respond to that? Do you think it's a, a, a kind of a bait and switch here that the real uh, object of progressive ideology is really to take down immigrants? No, and I, I'm pretty sure that many progressive leaders who happen to be immigrants would disagree with his statement, too. And I think that, you know, the bottom line here is that if Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama are the worst of the worst when it comes to the radical left, then they are the worst radicals that have ever existed in history because they're, like you said, Eric, they are centrist Democrats. You know, Barack Obama has a book called The Audacity of Hope where he talks about his political ideology. It's very centrist. He's praising Ronald Reagan. What radical is doing that? <laughs> right. Well, Dinesh D'Souza, Zerlina Maxwell, and Eric Bollard, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thanks.